Hello everyone, welcome, welcome back. This is Kings and Generals. Was Manza, Mansa Musa the wealthiest person who ever lived? See me click that thumbs up. If you could do that for me, that helps out tremendously. Subscribe to the channel if you find anything interesting and you want to keep up on things. You can uh, leave comments. I try to respond to people as often as I can. And you can donate to the channel through the thanks button. And you can request a video if you do. And I'll get to it and your name will be sponsoring the video. Okay? Not much else to talk about. Let's get into the video. We often come across lists and rankings of the wealthiest people in the world, which are... Sorry about that. Okay, now... Tech entrepreneurs, oil magnates, and heads of major corporations. And since we're living at the times when the 1% is only getting richer, we could assume that probably the richest men of our days are the richest men in history. But that is not the case, as many historians believe that the 14th century emperor of Mali, Mansa Musa, is in fact the richest individual in history, defining his wealth as indescribable. How has the relatively unknown monarch of a relatively unknown country managed to reach this status? In this episode of Kings and Generals, we're going to talk about Mansa Musa, his noteworthy reign, his immense wealth, and how it was demonstrated to the world. It's not a secret that we're fans of historical strategy games and Europa Universal. This video in Universalis is that there are hundreds of factions you can play with, and the the biggest challenge to have a more detailed description of the Mali Empire and Mansa Musa's rule is the lack of sources. There are a small number of works in Arabic of the historian Ibn Khaldun, the traveller Ibn Battuta, and the geographer Alamari. In the 16th to 17th centuries, some of the oral memories... I always laugh whenever I hear uh, Ibn Battuta, because I did a video on him and I found him very entertaining. So whenever I hear a video, I'm like, huh, it just brings me back. ...memories and traditions narrated by griots, equivalent to bards in Mali, have been written down as well. In the 15th century, Portuguese explorers and adventurers mentioned Mali here and there, but the best source available to us is Ibn Khaldun, which is still helpful in reconstructing the history of the Mali Empire and Mansa Musa's reign. The story of the Mali Empire is told to us by the epic of Sundieta. According to the epic, Sundieta Keita was the son of the king of the Mandinka people. Upon the death of his father, his brother became the new king, while Sundieta was exiled to the court of King of Mema. But when the Mandinka people asked Sundieta for help to repel an invasion by the Soso Empire, 18-year-old Sundieta raised an army from Mema and defeated the Soso in around 1235 at the Battle of Kiriana, paving the way for the establishment of the Mali Empire and Sundieta Keita becoming its first Mansa, emperor or king. The Mali Empire was ruled by the Mansa, but the emperor's rule was balanced with Gabara, a type of entity which reminds of the upper chamber of parliaments. Gabara united almost 30 clans, with each assigned their own task, ranging from participation and leadership in military campaigns to expertise in religious matters. Gabara voted on Kurigan Fuga, collections of laws, a proto-constitution of Mali. The Kurigan Fuga determined the roles of clans, called for humane treatment of slaves, established social organization of the subjects of the Mali Empire, and stipulated economic rules. The Empire of Mali was very rich in resources. It contained three large gold mines, which all belonged to the Mansa. At its apex, the Mali Empire owned almost half of the known gold reserves of the world. Mali also enjoyed a large supply of salt and copper, which was extracted through slave labor, essentially making the Mali Empire a slave owner state. With Europe still short of its global appeal and power of the Roman period, the major trade partners of Mali were the Middle Eastern trade cities and states. This was the context in which Musa came to power. He was initially a deputy of the Emperor Muhammad ibn Ku, others dispute that it was Abu Bakari II, who dreamed of finding new lands across the Atlantic. Sometime around 1311, he embarked on an expedition with 2,000 ships and left, leaving the reign to his deputy Musa, who became Mansa, since Muhammad ibn Ku never returned. Musa was no outsider to the Malian elite, 
as he was coming from the line of Sindhyatik Keita, the founder of the Mali Empire. He knew Arabic and was a devout Muslim. Mansa Musa is said to have expanded the trade network of the Mali Empire, making the country, and him personally as a Mansa, even wealthier. But while Mali and Mansa Musa were very rich, Sub-Saharan Africa was not really known much to the Europeans and Middle Eastern peoples. Whether out of religious duty, or as a campaign to demonstrate his and Mali's power and wealth, in 1324 he went on a pilgrimage to Mecca. According to Ibn Khaldun, who had interviewed one of the participants of this pilgrimage later, at each halt he, Musa, would regale us with rare foods and confectionery. His equipment and furnishings were carried by 12,000 private slave women wearing gowns of brocade and Yemeni silk. Furthermore, thousands of soldiers, members of the Malian royal court, along with tons of gold and provisions, accompanied Mansa Musa in his 4,000-mile pilgrimage to Mecca. Undoubtedly, it was quite a spectacle, a massive golden tent city moving through the desert. This was going to catch the attention of rulers of states through which Mansa Musa's procession was going. There was an interesting episode of Musa's visit to Cairo in 1324. According to Alumari, the Mamluk Sultan al malik and Nasir sent his envoy to invite Mansa Musa to his palace. The Malian emperor initially refused, stating that the sole purpose of his travel was the holy pilgrimage and nothing else. Nevertheless, Mansa Musa showed great courtesy and respect to the envoy, and offered gold and other valuables to be sent to the Mamluk Sultan as a token of his respect. Probably the biggest reason for Musa's initial refusal to see the Sultan was the fact that royal protocol demanded all visitors kiss the ground and the Sultan's hand. Finally, Mansa Musa gave up and agreed to meet the Sultan after long persuasion. When the moment of kneeling and kissing the ground came, he said, I make obeisance to Allah who created me, and kissed the ground, managing to avoid disrespecting his host, while also refusing to accept the Mamluk Sultan as his superior. Mansa Musa flooded the Sultan, his court, the city of Cairo, and its poor with gold. So much gold, that this most valuable commodity of that age had seen the decrease of its price due to high supply, causing an economic crisis in Egypt for over a decade. Overall, Musa's generosity during the pilgrimage actually hurt the region of the Middle East economically. The US-based technology company SmartAsset.com estimates that due to depreciation of gold, Mansa Musa's pilgrimage led to about $1.5 billion of economic losses across the Middle East. Some state that when Mansa Musa found out about the impact of his travel through Egypt, he tried to remove as much gold as possible from circulation in Egypt by buying the very gold he generously gifted to the people there. Lucy Duran of the School of African and Oriental Studies in London informs that Musa gave away so much of the Malian gold that the local griots were unhappy with him. He gave out so much Malian gold along the way that griots don't like to praise him in their songs because they think he wasted local resources outside the empire. But despite inadvertently causing an economic crisis in the Middle East, Mansa Musa managed to bring Mali to the attention of the Middle Eastern and European countries by demonstrating the immense wealth of his realm during the pilgrimage. Probably that is why there are more sources and information on Musa's post-pilgrimage reign. During Musa's reign, the Mali Empire expanded. On the way back from the pilgrimage in 1325, he added the region of Gao with an important trading city of Timbuktu to the empire, but sources do not really inform us on how it happened. Regardless of how it happened, Timbuktu became an important part of Mansa Musa's realm. Mali's wealth allowed Musa to embark on a massive construction effort throughout the empire, particularly Timbuktu. During Mansa Musa's reign, the world-famous Jingeriba Mosque, which was built from mud brick and wood and is still standing, was constructed in Timbuktu. Another important construction project was the University of Senkore of the Senkore Madrasa, which became one of the greatest centers of Islamic learning in the world. Law, astronomy, medicine, religion, and other disciplines were taught there. It is said that Musa brought scholars on the way back from the pilgrimage, who helped to establish the academic foundation of this university. An Andalusian poet and architect named Abu Es Haq Es Saheli 
who is believed to be responsible for the design of the Jingareba Mosque, was among this group. By the end of Musa's reign, the University of St. Kore is said to have had almost 25,000 students, with one of the largest libraries in the world, in possession of 800,000 manuscripts, according to Casely Hayford. Gao and Timbuktu were not the only regions and cities captured by Mansa Musa. He is said to have annexed 24 cities in total during his reign. What, did, did he just buy them? Because I'm not getting anything about him that comes off as hostile or warlike. He's just somebody who handled things by throwing money at it. I mean, that's just crazy. By the end of his reign, the Mali Empire stretched for approximately 2,000 miles from the shore of the Atlantic to modern-day Niger, possessing lands of modern-day Mali, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Ivory Coast, Niger, Nigeria, Chad, Mauritania, and Burkina Faso. Mansa Musa's impact made his empire known to Europe and the Middle East. In 1375, the Catalan Atlas map added the Mali Empire, with a drawing of an African king sitting on the golden throne in Timbuktu with a piece of gold in his hand. Musa's reign ended sometime between 1332 and 1337, when he died. He was succeeded by his son, who was said to be a bad and profligate Mansa. He was succeeded by his brother Mansa Suleiman, who helped to rebuild the empire's treasury and put it back on the track of development. Later Mansas were less successful, and from 1389 onwards, the Mali Empire entered a state of disintegration. This shows that mere wealth was not enough to keep a huge empire like Mali together, hinting at Mansa Musa's good administration skills as well. But how rich was Mansa Musa exactly? We know that Mansas, the emperors of the Mali Empire, owned all the gold in the country. We are not aware of any sudden or drastic increase in gold production in Mali, or the discovery of new gold mines during Musa's reign, which would potentially make him richer than his predecessors or successors. So we can claim that all other major emperors of Mali were arguably as rich as Musa, but unlike the others, Musa had been able to put himself and Mali on the map thanks to his pilgrimage, amazing people in the Middle East with all his gold, glamour and generosity, and making historians write about him. There are different descriptions of his wealth. The history professor of the University of Michigan says, Imagine as much gold as you think a human being could possess, and double it. That's what all the accounts are trying to communicate. This is the richest guy anyone has ever seen. Rudolf Butch Ware of the University of California argues that contemporary accounts of Musa's wealth are so breathless that it's almost impossible to get a sense of just how wealthy and powerful he truly was. Some have tried to come up with a figure, with $400 billion being a popular estimate adjusted for inflation. But probably the best way to explain Mansa Musa's wealth was written by Jacob Davidson on Money.com, richer than anyone could describe. Unfortunately, there is a lack of sources to describe Mansa Musa's reign, life and wealth in more detail. But what we have is enough to argue that Musa was a successful military leader, since he is attributed with annexing 24 cities and expanding the Mali Empire. He could be described as a progressive person who understood the importance of education and science for the prosperity of his realm. But Mansa Musa is mostly known for his wealth and is widely believed to be the richest individual in history. More videos on economic history. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with him getting the 24 cities. I, I think he very well could have just bought them. Buying them, buying the leadership there, you know, whatever, who was that, whoever was in charge, and basically just saying, okay, listen, I'm this is, boom, I'm buying this. And you are now, a, you know, a trade partner, a strategic property of mine. Because it doesn't, and I'm not saying he wasn't a military guy, but it doesn't, it didn't offer anything to make me think he was. I, I just got to believe that with all the money that he had, he could offer you so much money that was more than you ever knew existed, 
And that was nothing. And you got to believe that. I mean, if he had twelve thousand women on his on his pilgrimage, carrying his gold, the guy had people that were willing to take money to defend him. So, very. I want to know a little bit more about this guy, Mr. Musa. But I won't learn that now. So I'm going to go ahead and end the video. And until next time, if you have uh, another video that is uh, just as good about him, I know Biographics has one. I'll probably look at that one next. But until then, have a good day, have a good night.